Rachel's slides. There we go. And without further ado, Rachel Wood, take it away. Thank you very much in indeed. Thank you, Jack, our wonderful Master of Ceremonies. So yes, we are addressing the slight elephant in the room this evening, uh, what caused the Cambrian explosion. Uh, we've had a wonderful range of talks uh, over the last uh, weeks, months, uh, probing all these various aspects of the Cambrian explosion. For example, how are these fossils preserved? How did they start to move? Uh, the origin of skeletons, biomineralization, when did that appear and in what groups? And what did these animals actually look like and what they have been? These are all very, very profound problems. And the, the issue really with what caused the, the, the Cambrian explosion is that it is a very complex, multifaceted uh, um, issue that requires the input of many, many different uh, types of geoscience. So this is what I, I would like to address tonight what triggered Cambrian explosion. Now, this has been something that has been very inspirational in science, but also when I was putting this talk together, I realized there's quite a musical theme here. So I had no idea that the atomic metapagans have actually put out an album uh, called The Cambrian Explosion. And you can see what type of music it is. You've got Hallucigenia there playing a banjo. It's a lovely sort of bluegrass uh, um, Virginia music. It's on YouTube if you want to hear it. So uh, the Cambrian explosion has been tremendously inspirational actually to art, to a bit of music, um, and also of course to scientists for, for many decades. And as I said, this is really a multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary problem. So to tackle it, we really have to look beyond paleontology alone to other uh, forms, uh, other disciplines within geoscience, particularly geochemistry, but also sedimentology and uh, stratigraphy to try and constrain the timing when everything happened. So you can see here that the many of my, my, my co-authors are or my co-workers are listed, and they are um, from uh, geochemistry, isotope geochemistry, aqueous geochemistry, but also sedimentologists, edentologists, and many current and former PhD students. Um, I'm a firm believer in international collaboration is a, as a, one of our most profound aspects of being a scientist. So there are many colleagues here who I've had wonderful collaborations with for many decades from, for example, Namibia, uh, Germany, and Russia. So what triggered the Cambrian explosion? Just to recap uh, where we are. So from approximately three and a half billion years ago to 575 million years ago, if you were snorkeling over the, the seafloor at this time, you would have seen a lot, uh, the seafloor was dominated by microbial life. So in other words, things that are akin to uh, modern stromatolites, which you can see in the top right-hand corner, these are the famous stromatolites from Shark Bay. Uh, and we see in the record, many of these stromatolites, the other images there are of uh, Precambrian, general Precambrian stromatolites. And then at approximately three, 575 million years ago, bursting onto the scene uh, in many different areas, we see the first signs of what we call complex life. For example, A and B there show clearly fossils, uh, trace fossils, things that have moved over the substrate, move, moved over the sea floor. So in other words, we see evidence of mobility. Uh, we see curious uh, stemmed tubular forms there in C. And also, a little bit later towards this 30 million year uh, period, we see forms that had bilateral symmetry. And we've heard a lot about these possible bilaterians. So here in here and here, these forms with bilateral symmetry. So, uh, and of course, also at this time, we see the very, very first forms with a skeleton. So those little tubular fossils shown in H are the first uh, forms actually gained a calcareous skeleton. The problem is many of these forms, we really have very little idea what they are in terms of affinity. Some may be animals and some maybe not. So we're, we get more and more secure about these potentially being animals get, as we get closer to the Cambrian or the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. And then of course, from a, approximately 540 million years ago, we see the, the Cambrian explosion itself where many of the fossils appear of are much more familiar and we can easily slot them into modern groups. 
so such as the trilobites there, but other, other, other arthropods, you've heard about those in wonderful detail from Derek Briggs and various other groups. Um, and the, these are almost certainly all animals. So that sort of sets the, the stage in terms of the timing. And if we put this timing now into a, a geological column, you've been familiar with some of these uh, time zones introduced in previous talks. Uh, you can see we've got the Precambrian Cambrian boundary there at about uh, 540 million years ago here. The time period before is the Ediacaran, and before that we have this period called the Cryogenian. Uh, it's when all the incredible snowball earths happened, or when uh, the two dominant snowball earths occurred. And if we place our knowledge, our fossil record now, um, within this time uh, frame, we can see, first of all, Here's the evidence for the really well accepted fossil record of animals. And the well accepted record really only goes back to very close to the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. But if we go a little bit further back in time, we have these uh, branching events of when we believe that showing the interrelatedness of some of these groups. And the, these are not that controversial. Some of them are very secure. In other words, we know how these groups are related to each other, as shown by these, these branches of the family tree. But what is incredibly uh, unclear and, and poorly constrained is the actual timing. So you can see there the timing with some of those pale blue lines. I'll just highlight a few. For example, here between um, the mollusks and the annelids, I think I've actually put it in the wrong place there, sorry. Um, the, the, here, yes, here. Um, the timing is actually very, very uncertain. It could be anywhere between those uh, bits of time, anywhere between the, the middle and the late Ediacaran. And you can see that all those branching events really are quite unclear. In other words, there's a huge uncertainty on when those events, those branching events actually happened. Now, if we go back even further to of the very vexing problem of the origin of the animals, the Metazoa, the uncertainty really is, uh, the, 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 the uncertainty of timing really becomes huge. You've heard a lot about these uh, possible biomarkers shown by the star uh, and the arrow uh, indicating Metazoa, but there's a lot of controversy as to whether these really are the biomarkers of, of animals or not. And then, so if we go back to the, the, the branching event that we're particularly interested in, the branching event of the metazoa themselves, we can see there, as I've highlighted in red, uh, although we have a, a branching point between the, um, the, 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 with the metazoa, you can see that there's an enormous amount of uncertainty when the metazoa actually appeared. Did they appear at the beginning of the Toyonian, any time during the Toyonian, or indeed any time during the Cryogenian? So this is the problem that we're grappling with. There is re really, it's very, um, we, we have very little idea about when animals really did appear in the geological record or, or appear uh, in geological time because the record may be mute. So this is the problem really. What, one idea is that uh, animals are actually very old. They did appear in the Tetonian perhaps or even in the Cryogenian. But they were simply very, very small. They didn't have a fossilizable hard skeleton. And they were so tiny um, that they um, wouldn't leave any trace fossils either. So I've just plonked a sort of a, a possible image of one of these very early possible ancestral uh, bilaterian animals uh, at uh, Metazoa. So this, this could explain this uh, apparent gap between when we uh, when the molecular phylogeny of the DNA t tells us that animals must have appeared, but when they actually come to dominance in the fossil record. But there's another idea which is, has gained a huge amount of traction uh, in recent years. It is still slightly controversial and it's also very complex, but that is that the rise of animals to ecological dominance, which is really what we see in the Cambrian explosion, is due to an external constraint. And one of those external constraints could be levels of oxygen. And this is because we know that uh, oxygen is a prerequisite to the functioning of animals. And this is an idea that was um, proposed really quite a long time ago by Nursel in 1959. So the idea of the connection between uh, sufficient oxygen being present in the atmospheres and therefore present in the seas uh, and the rise of animals. And this, this 
there's, there's no doubt that all complex life, be it animals and, many, and plants, require oxygen. They require a certain amount of oxygen to uh, undertake all their metabolic capabilities. So there's no doubt that there must be a connection in some shape or form between animals and sufficient oxygen being available to them. Now, one issue is that part of this idea is that when you start to respire, uh, energy um, that cells can produce via respiration, uh, once they are respiring oxygen, this increases by about 20 times. So once you, you go from anaerobic to aerobic res respiration, you can really create a huge amount of extra energy. And the, the hypothesis suggests that this extra energy is, is what is needed and that powers the generation of ex extra complexity of life. So, for example, it allows things to get, get very, very large, allows the evolution of more complex uh, body structures and organs. So, for example, a nervous system and muscles and also it allows the formation of skeletons. We know that on, on, you need a certain amount of oxygen dissolved in uh, seawater that allows marine animals to start to produce a skeleton. Skeletons have all sorts of functions, but one of their primary functions is to, to defend. And of course, once your predator, that what you, what's going to eat you, has developed teeth, you need something that will withstand and defend you against those teeth. So by hard parts, I mean both defensive and predatory structures such as teeth. And of course, it also allows you to explore high energy lifestyles, energy intensive movement, in other words. So, for example, a predatory lifestyle itself. So this uh, rather garish um, graphic is really just showing this idea that, that maybe life, uh, animal life went through a bottleneck of uh, th that allowed once oxygen levels have reached a certain threshold, it allowed the manifestation of all this complexity in our geological deep past. So let's consider what the Earth was like um, around the Precambrian, uh, around the uh, during the Cambrian, or just before the Cambrian explosion. This is going back about 10 million years before the Ediacara and Cambrian boundary. So as far as we know, our Earth was very, very different from today. Uh, you can see this is where all the continents were. Uh, our, our best guesses. The continents were quite unlike. Uh, the, the, the continents that we recognize. So, for example, Siberia was a separate continent, North China was a separate continent, and South China was a separate continent, all sitting in very different places in the globe. Because, of course, they've had 550 million years of, uh, of time to whiz around and form the configuration that we see today. Uh, you can see that uh, most of the continents were microcontinent, in other words, they were very small, and they straddled the equator. And we know that the tropics are places uh, where we often have the origin of new life, new, new uh, species. So already we have a feeling that because these were microcontinents, they had a lot of shallow marine seas around them. So the availability of lovely, warm, shallow marine seas to uh, innovate life was already very primed just by this paleogeographical configuration of our continents. But we also know that uh, the present is not the key to the past. We're looking back in deep time here. The world really was remarkably different. For example, there were no land plants, no vascular plants, living on land, no trees. Also, our best indications of the climate was that it was hotter than today. And of course, we're dealing with continents here that are all tropical and subtropical. And also, there's every indication that atmospheric oxygen levels, and therefore oxygen levels in the seas, were also lower. How much lower is difficult to tell. Now, where, does, where do we get that oxygen from today? Well, most of the oxygen is actually formed by photosynthesis. So about two thirds of it are formed by tiny photosynthesizers uh, in the seas. And the other uh, third or so are formed by land plants. So, and of course, we have no land plants uh, in the Cambrian. So, some sources of oxygen simply, or an abundant source of oxygen, important source of oxygen today, was simply not present in the Ediacaran and, and uh, pre Cambrian times. Uh, and Cambrian, of course. Now, if we, we think about where oxygen was sitting, sits today in the modern oceans, it's not. Uh, equally distributed throughout our oceans. Here, of course, is 
the configuration of continents as we see it today. And you can see here, this is sh shown as dissolved oxygen in the oceans with the very warm colors showing high amounts of oxygen going down to the very cold colors showing low amounts of oxygen. And it's immediately apparent that you've got a lot of oxygen dissolved in the polar regions. And you have these incredible blue, cold, uh, oxygen depleted waters that form essentially um, upwelling against the western sides of our continents. And also we have a lot of um, uh, coal, uh, oxygen depleted water forming where you have these very, very major rivers like the Ganges and the Brahmaputra. And this is because these uh, upwelling of cold, uh, nutrient rich uh, waters from the Arctic and also the, the, the rivers bringing down nutrient rich waters, they create a huge amount of production in the ocean of life. And that life is did then depletes the ocean of water of oxygen. So we have what's known as these oxygen minimum zones uh, formed by continental runoff from rivers, from major river systems, and also from upwelling of cold and nutrient rich waters from the poles against our western sides of our continents. Now this has a major effect on structuring the ecosystems that live in these areas. So for example, in uh, some of these areas, not, not all, we, where the oxygen levels grow, get very, very depleted. In these areas, you get a re huge reduction of the diversity of life. And there's very, very little there that actually can, is, is reaches any significant size. The food webs are very simple and the food chains are very, very short. And also, there's nothing there that produces a skeleton. And this is in great contrast to the areas where we have a lot of oxygen. I've just put an arrow here on the near the Great Barrier Reef for convenience. We have very complex food webs. Uh, the water column is teeming with diverse life, and we have uh, the ability of animals to produce extensive areas of, of skeletal production by mineralization. So, in other words, the amount of oxygen in the ocean really does have a huge impact on the diversity of life and also the type of life. Uh, that you, you find in today's oceans. So how do we put this now into the context of what we're interested in, the Cambrian explosion and the origin of the, of the Cambrian explosion? So this is this idea that uh, we have the history of life here shown in this graphic, and it's shown here very much as a, a linear narrative, but we know that it's far more complex than this. There are all sorts of feedbacks between life and the environment. We have this, this uh, relentless uh, change and increase in complexity is a very simple way of thinking about evolution and it's interrupted for example by mass extinctions. So in other words we have this constant dialogue between the changing environment and the opportunity that gives for evolutionary innovation and the feedbacks between them. So how can we think about oxygen as uh, an environmental opportunity and how does changes in oxygen levels perhaps lead to evolutionary innovations. So I want to just suggest two hypotheses of this talk, and this is the first one, which is that oxygen controlled the rise of animals. So this is a very simple statement. So how might we test this? Well, of course, part of the issue is how much oxygen did ancient animals actually need? Well, this is a very difficult, problematic uh, question to ask, because if we look back um, the time, we have all these various possible animals, but ma many of them are definitely not animals. So for example, we have here, this is definitely not an animal. This is a, a bit of a, a complex algae. These forms here may almost almost certainly not be animals. The jury really is out on whether this is an animal or not. And as you get closer to the Ediacar and Cambrian boundary, these forms are increasingly more certain of probably animals. And that's sort of all we can say at the moment. But if we look at uh, modern animals and their demands for uh, oxygen, the uh, re recently it was discovered that modern sponges, which of course are, are right at the base of the food tree of animals, modern sponges there can actually exist in very, very low levels of oxygen. So between uh, uh, 0.5 and 4% of present atmospheric levels, so really very, very low levels compared to humans, for example. 
However, not all animals have the same oxygen requirements. While sponges uh, um, have very, or some of them at least, have very low um, oxygen requirements, more complex life forms such as this have uh, much higher requirements. And these are worms, polychaetes. And in fact, as polychaetes develop more and more predatory carnivorous lifestyles, they demand more and more oxygen. So we have here the first indication, perhaps, that all animals are not created equal, that depending on your lifestyle, you may actually need more oxygen. With increasingly intense demanding lifestyles, and particularly predatory lifestyles that demand very rapid movement to, to capture prey, need high amounts of oxygen. So if we, go, we think back at, about the oxygen in the oceans today, uh, we can start to put some terminology on it. So everything with uh, above two microliters and higher, we term oxic. And those uh, colors shown in those cold colors in blue, we can term disoxic. And then very, very low oxygen, uh, no oxygen at all, vanishingly small amounts we call anoxic. So these are the terms I want to introduce you to just to show you how we try and uh, interrogate this problem in deep time simply because we simply can't go back to the ancient record of animals and work out how much oxygen they needed. So if we think about oxygen in the modern ocean, so these are these terms I've just introduced to you, oxic, disoxic, and anoxic. And you can see here below, I've just put on uh, the amount of oxygen this refers to. So oxic is more than above two microliters, between 0.1 and 2 we call disoxic, and then very, very little here is anoxic. Now, we have to use, uh, because we can't go back and actually measure the amount of oxygen in the oceans, we have to use proxies. So oh, sorry, just before I mention the proxies, just to show you that therefore in oxic conditions, this has this huge effect on life. So in uh, oxic conditions, we have a biodiverse life, uh, complex food webs and animals with skeletons. In uh, suboxic or disoxic, we see very small, thin-walled animals with no skeletons, and then we get no life living on the seafloor at all in anoxic conditions. So how can we probe this in deep time? Well, we have to use what's called proxies. So proxies are simply uh, uh, things that we can measure in the rocks, uh, um, chemical signatures that we know change with oxygen. So in other words, chemicals that react to different redox states. So chem chemicals that show either a different state in anoxic, disoxic, or oxic waters. And so we can take some particular uh, elements and uh, all the minerals that they form and use these as proxies to probe ancient oxygen levels. So for example, if we go to uh, anoxic waters, you can see here in this, in this figure, that we've got the sediment water interface and in oxic, here's the sediment water interface here, and you can see in oxic conditions all the water column is oxygen and then a little bit of the seafloor is oxygenated, well, oxygenated as well. But as we go into the disoxic conditions, you can see the seafloor is no longer oxygenated, it becomes actually anoxic. And as we move into these two anoxic states, you can see that the water column away from where most animals are living on the seafloor has become anoxic. So there are two different states of anoxia that we can look at. One is where you have a lot of dominant iron and it's called ferruginous. So we can look at the behavior of iron and say whether that water was anoxic or oxic. Also, we can look at uh, seawater that has a lot of free sulfur. And this is called sulfidic or euxinic. And so we can look at this behavior as a proxy. And then finally, disoxic waters, very low oxygen waters, often have some enrichment of uh, particular species of manganese. And so they are manganous rich. So we can use these proxies then to measure in rocks and build up a story of really how oxygenation has changed through geological time. It's very labor intensive work. You have to take the rocks, grind them into a powder, and then put them through uh, extraction by acids. And I'm just going to show you, to give you some nuts and bolts here, of one method that we use. And this is called iron speciation, Fe speciation. 
And although it sounds complicated, it's actually very simple. All it is, is it takes, you measure the, the amount of total iron in your rock, and you just separate out these types of ions, so iron carbonate, iron oxide, pyrite, and so forth. And you just create a, a ratio of the total amount of these to the total amount of iron. So here's the ratio up here. So a ratio of these reactive iron species, if the ratio is below 0.22, we know that that rock was, was deposited with free oxygen in oxic waters. If it was deposited above 0.38, we know that it was deposited in anoxic waters. We can also tell by the ratio of pyrite to these reactive species, whether it was produced in the presence of uh, lots of iron or sulfur. In other words, whether it's ferruginous or euxinic. So in other words, we have here a powerful technique to go into the rock record and work out what was the, uh, what was the um, our sediment deposited in the presence of oxygen and if, or in anoxia, or whether it's in free sulfur or in ferruginous iron rich conditions. So we've been working for a very long time to try and put together a record. And this is now the record, the start of the record from a huge number of activity all over the world. Many, many different research groups are working on this. And you can see that in total, we've, we've reached a picture, of, 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 this is the, the, the sort of beginning of a picture, the summarized picture of really where oxygen was sitting on the planet for this key bit of, bit of time. So you can see here, here's the, uh, Ediacar and Cambrian boundary. And you can see that right through the snowball earths and the cryogenian, you can see the snowball earths there, these tropical glaciations, the earth was really, the, the, the seawater was really anoxic. It's, it's dominated by these green ferruginous waters. And at mid depths, you see this red coloration coming and going. So this was almost certainly euxinic with free sulfur. And then at some point after this final snowball earth here, the Gaskers in the middle of the, in the uh, Ediacaran, we think then this is when oxygenation started. You can see these blue arrows coming down and starting to oxygenate the ocean. So uh, this is a, a, a simplified view of how we think oxygen developed in our seas through this bit of geological time. And the view until just a few years ago. Now, I want to take you now to the record that we have in just one area, Namibia, for the last 10 million years of the Ediacaran. So this, this bit of time, and this is very much the, the time, the precursor to the base of the Cambrian and the Cambrian explosion. So here is um, an outcrop uh, just showing you from Namibia. It's a wonderful place to do field work. Um, it, the, the outcrops are, are extremely extensive. There's no vegetation to cover them up. And you can trace beds for hundreds of kilometers. And the other reason we go there, it's just this critical bit of time, uh, 10 million years, just before the Precambrian Cambrian boundary. And also we have lots of trace fossils, lots of soft-bodied fossils, and also lots of fossils with skeletons. So we can, we can really understand the relationship between oxygenation with, in concert with the animals themselves. So again, looking at this map of the paleogeography at this time, uh, you can see here shown in the red star, this is where Namibia was sitting at this time. It was sitting just uh, south of the equator, probably 25 degrees or so to 30 degrees south of the equator. So, uh, but remember, uh, we, the, the, where the continents are has a huge impact on where oxygen is actually sitting in the earth. So we could imagine that the continents had a very, because they had a very different configuration at this time, almost certainly where oxygen, the distribution of oxygen in the seas was not homogenous through this area. It could well have been very, very different in different parts and in these different microcontinents. So what we've been doing for the last 10 years or so is trying to build up a picture of what's happening to oxygen through time through these 30 million years or so of the record here in Namibia, but also in space. And we've chosen Namibia because the rocks are not only very well preserved, but because we have fortuitously got these two basins or two seas, and we can compare the behavior of these two seas through time. 
So one is a base in the north and the base in the south. So we can first of all ask the question, do these basins have the same history or are they different? And just to show you here, here's a cross section to the two basins. So going from north to south here, and these are just the names of all the places we've been uh, gathering data. And we've been gathering data to, to gain, uh, to, to, to look at the behavior. So for example, Svartmuda here is in a very, very shallow seas, but we go right out to Brack, which is in very deep seas. So in other words, we can create a transect from very shallow waters out to deep waters, and we can look at where exactly oxic waters were sitting and where anoxic waters were sitting. So in other words, we can, we can in effect create a 4D framework, so in space and in time. And just to show you these dates here in red, these are the dates we've got from ash beds. These are what's called radiometric dates. And just to show you that the, the ages are pretty well constrained, so we can actually put our oxygen framework, our redox story into a very nice time framework. So we've spent many, many hours collecting samples. It's very laborious, taking samples maybe every meter. And what we're looking for is evidence of anoxia. So this is the second musical hint. Uh, this is actually a heavy metal, I just not, it's a death metal band from Nor Norway. So I decided I probably wouldn't play you a, 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 a clip of this music. So anyway, we're looking for anoxia in these sediments. And uh, just to show you in a, a bit of detail, this sort of data that we're getting, this is data collected by a former uh, PhD student, Fred Boyer. And you can see an enormous amount of data goes into trying to understand these stories. And here, all you have to notice here is it's color coded. Black is anoxic, blue is oxic, and then we've got this purple, which is the manganous low oxygen waters. And what's useful here is to then look at this cartoon showing the behavior of where anoxic waters were sitting in these two basins. And what you can immediately see is the beginning of the record here is a huge amount of anoxic water sitting in these basins, only a very, very thin veneer of oxygen, oxygenated waters. And you can see that our early possible animals, our complex life, is just sitting there clinging to these oxygenated waters here. Now, as we pass up through, you can see that the uh, anoxic waters have retreated at this point, then they're coming up again, then they're coming up even further, and then they retreat. And then by this stage, very close to Precambrian-Cambrian boundary, we have fully oxygenated conditions. So in other words, we have a history of very, very dynamic redox. But the obvious thing is, is when we put on, our, on this record where all the actual oldest animals were sitting, they are all clinging to these very, very oxygenated waters. In other words, life was only living in these well oxygenated waters, not even in low oxygen waters. So we can start to say that this, these, these oldest animals, at least in Namibia, needed well oxygenated conditions. Now, if we look at the story through time, what you can see is this is these are just a bird's eye view of these two seas connected. Uh, and if you were flying over it, where these bodies of anoxic and anoxic water were, and you can see that in the oldest bit of time here, that these uh, huge amounts of the seas were covered and uh, had a lot of anoxic water. But as we progress through time, you can see them disappearing. And the critical time around 545 million years ago, they start to disappear altogether from this northern basin. The northern basin is lovely and oxygenated, a little bit still of anoxic water in the southern basin. But then by the time we get to here, um, in the very latest bit of the record, we have fully oxygenated conditions. So we see a progressive change of oxygenation through time. So how does this really affect the animals? We've already shown that the animals are just clinging on to these oxygen, very local areas of oxygenated waters. But if we actually plot what's happening through time and where they're actually living, we can see, first of all, let's look at the, the burrow record, the trace fossil record. Here at the beginning, there's very few burrowers and there's very small percentage, very low intensity of burrowing. But you can see by the time we get to the top of the record, pretty intensive burrowing on bedding planes. 
And also, if we compare the record of the soft-bodied forms, so here shown in green, and the skeletal forms with hard part shown in blue, you can see also at the top of the record that they suddenly appear in deeper waters. Everything is clinging before that stage to uh, shallow waters and medium depth waters, and only at the very top of this record do they start to march down and get it, start to inhabit deeper waters. In other words, what we're seeing is as anoxic waters fade away into the deeper waters and the whole basin, basins become very well oxygenated, the animals are simply following it. So there's a relationship, a very close relationship between animals, where animals lived, and where the anoxic waters are. So I think we can effectively prove our first hypothesis and say that it looks like the availability of oxygen can seem to have controlled where animals could live by expanding their habitats as oxygen became more and more available, at least in this record in Namibia, close to the Precambrian, to the Ediacar and Cambrian boundary. So let's think about this in a little bit more detail. So this is the, the figure I showed you before, and I wasn't entirely straight because, in fact, this simple story turns out to be far more complicated. Rather than simply being one phase of oxygenation, we may well have all these pulses of oxygen. And these are the ones that have been recognized already, and there may well be many more. So in other words, the Earth, it was as if the Earth was oxygenating in a series of events, whereas a pulse of oxygen, then it went back to a, a more anoxic state, pulse of oxygen, more anoxic state, and so forth. And what's interesting is if you look at these uh, pulses of oxygen, what you can see is that they correspond to where our the record of our carbon cycle, which is shown by these stable carbon isotopes, shows a change. You can see each of these red boxes is enclosing often a negative excursion, really very, very deep negative excursion here, 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 sometimes a twin positive and negative excursion. Now, we don't fully understand the relationship between these, but what is suggested is that there's a relationship between these pulses of oxygen and these perturbations to the carbon cycle. So let's finally go to the Cambrian itself, itself the, the record from the beginning of the Cambrian up to the end of the early Cambrian. Here's our, our second final hypothesis, which is that actually this, these dynamic redox events actually controlled the tempo of the Cambrian explosion, the Ediacar and Cambrian explosion. In other words, this very dynamic, unstable oxygenation may itself have been a driver of evolution. So I want to consider something that is easy to measure in the fossil record, and that's just the size of something, the body size. So here you can see all these uh, marine snails, these gastropods, that I've um, showed a photograph here. They're very variable in size. These are actually, these are all one species, these are one species, and so on. You can see they are very, very variable in size. Now, this idea that, uh, and, and there's a, there's a general idea that was produced, or a general sort of hypothesis, by this American uh, paleontologist called Edward Cope. And it's called Cope's Rule. And he suggested, uh, back in Victorian times, that if you look at animals in one evolutionary lineage, they tend to get bigger with time. So this is called Cope's Rule. And the reason for this was suggested was simple predator-prey relationships. In other words, Big, animal, big fish eat little fish, and little fish, fish eat tiny fish, and so on. In other words, it's good to be big. The bigger you are, the more you can eat. You, have, you are a much more superior predator and competitor, and you can produce more offspring. So in other words, all these very clear uh, ecological and evolutionary reasons for being big. And he suggested this was a, a trend in all lineages through their evolution. Now, this has been gained a lot of uh, attention more recently. So, for example, first of all here, you can see this amazing plot of many, many different groups. So, all the arthropods, in other words, the things related to uh, crabs and lobsters, the lamp shells, the brachiopods, the sea urchins, the crinoids, all the mollusks, in other words, the bivalves, the cephalopods, and then vertebrates, 
And you can see all of them, when you plot up their body size through time, it slowly gets bigger. And this thick black line in the middle here shows you slowly increasing from the Cambrian right up to the present day. In other words, Cope's rule really seems to uh, be true when you look at the whole, um, um, a, a huge data set uh, through uh, and, and, and look at it over a very, very long, large time scale, long time scale. However, what about smaller changes? So for example, here we have uh, just a plot showing you these, um, another type of fossil, these are tiny micro fossils, and they show something opposite, which is that they tend to get smaller when oxygen levels decrease. In other words, when you have a mass extinction, which is often caused by anoxia, uh, they, just go forward here, a, a mass extinction caused by an, uh, anoxia, they tend to get very, very small. And we see this in many, many mass extinctions, where mass extinctions are caused also by this encroachment of anoxic waters into the area where uh, things are living in the shallow marine uh, areas or even deep water areas, but an encroachment, encroachment of anoxic um, waters causes this quite dramatic change of body size. And this was given the name the Lilliput effect. I think I've just, I'm just, my video here is covering up Gulliver's image, but Lilliput after uh, Swift's fine novel. So uh, this is on, yeah, this is looking at this at shorter time scales. So we have evidence for things getting smaller during mass extinctions, but we, it's all be, also been suggested that we have evidence for things getting bigger through time, as you saw before, and this is being suggested to be related to oxygen levels. So here you can see a plot just showing A, where we how we think oxygen may have slowly increased in terms of um, in terms of present day levels through geological time. Now this plot is a little bit dated now, but you can see here is the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary, and you can see the idea is that we didn't reach modern levels really until uh, probably sometime after the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary. But what this plot seems to suggest is that uh, you can correlate the actual size of things through all of geological time, here shown as their complete, their, the volume of animals. And you can see the general volume of all of life seems to have slowly increased through geological time. Whether you're a single cell, uh, a single primitive cell, a prokaryote, a single a more complex cell eukaryote, or if you're a blue, blue whale or a giant sequoia tree. So this is a prevalent idea that there's a relationship between oxygen and body size, increase of oxygen and decrease of oxygen. But, no, but what we really want to understand is how does this relate then to the Cambrian explosion? So here's our paleogeographic map again of the Earth uh, at this bit of geological time. And now we're going to go to Siberia, here shown by the red star. Now, Siberia is a very different kettle of fish to do field work. You're very much limited to outcrops along the huge major, major river systems. So this is the Udama uh, River of Siberia. Uh, all of the areas behind the river systems are dense forest and, and inaccessible with very few outcrops. So, but we have an incredible fossil record, uh, mostly started and developed and gained by the, uh, the paleontologists of the Soviet Union but uh, also continued by many Russians and international groups today. And what I was interested in looking at with my colleague from Moscow State University, Andrei Zhravlov, is how do body sizes actually change during Cambrian explosion? So we went to the literature and we also made a lot of measurements in the field, and we just took four groups which are relatively, have got a relatively good record. So first of all, these sponges, they're the first reef building animals of the Cambrian. Some mollusks, some very curious animals that are uh, fairly primitive and po possibly related to uh, the, um, uh, yeah, they're the, 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 the distant relatives of mollusks. And then these brachiopods, the lamp shells. And these numbers here just show you how many species we measured. So we measured the size of all these uh, fossils that we could get both from the literature and in the field. And we plotted them up according to time, so when they appeared in the geological record. So here's our plot. And what we've plotted here is just the longest dimension, linear dimension. 
And you can see it's, it's color coded for all these different groups. Don't worry about the, the detailed names, but you can see there are some very, very dramatic time cha uh, changes in body size. So this is just the beginning of the Cambrian here up to the end of the early, early Cambrian. So this is a record only over about 30 or so million years or 25 million years. Now, first, I want to point your attention to the first mass extinction in the geological record. That's shown here by this red line. It's going to be shown as a red line in all the uh, forthcoming plots. Just uh, here, this red line. And it's called the Sinsk event. And it's named after some rocks in the Sinsk area. And this is the first mass extinction, and it's caused by anoxia. So huge amounts of organic rich black shells are deposited in Siberia at this time. And you can see, first of all, from this plot, that the body size of all these forms uh, immediately after this Sinsk event here get small here. So a huge reduction in body size uh, at this time. It's the Lilliput effect. But more remarkable, when you look at all these groups, they show an increase here up to this point, And then many of them show a decrease here and then perhaps a slight increase here, and then an increase again. Sorry about my, my lines a little bit, uh, not quite in the right place, but increase again. So in other words, if we look at these body size changes through the Cambrian explosion, there are very, very dynamic changes. Now, if we then pull out these groups individually, so first of all, the sponges, and you can show uh, this is, this is uh, a plot that simply shows the minimum and the maximum, and then where most of the data uh, the measurements are sitting in the bo in the grey boxes here, and you can see at the bottom of the x-axis, this is the same uh, time axis, these 25 or so million years. And I'll just pull out for you where the the, the the mean is sitting. It's very very low in the early earliest early Cambrian. Then it goes high, then it goes low again, high again, and then at the Sinsk event, um, it the, there's a, a notable body size change in the Archaeocyas. The mollusks show a very similar pattern, and the hyaliths as well show a very similar pattern. In other words, something remarkable is happening here. All these groups, which are not closely related, are showing synchronous changes in body size. They're all increasing at the same time and decreasing at the same time, and they all show the Lilliput effect after this Sinsk mass extinction. And I've just highlighted there in blue where the biggest body size is, and you can see it's more or less at the same time. Now, if we add the brachiopod data, what's so interesting is these show a totally different pattern. Not the same at all. They start big, they get small, and then they actually get bigger after the mass extinction. So a totally different pattern. And it's very, very difficult to understand how to explain this. But it's, it's suggestive that whatever is causing these three groups to hold, oh, sorry, wrong place, um, all these three groups here to show similar size changes, the brachiopods are showing something very, very different. Now, let's also consider individual species. Well, it turns out that individual species are also changing size. You can see it's seen most closely here with the archaeocyst sponges. They start off small, they get big, then they decrease again, then they get a bit bigger. And here are a few data for the mollusks and the hyaliths. But the brachiopods get small, but those species that can change get small and then they get bigger again after Simsk. So all these early Cambrian animals are responding in some way to something going on in the environment uh, that is ch triggering these changes in their body size both getting bigger and getting smaller. And what's particularly remarkable is even individual species are showing really uh, adaptive changes, incredible changes in body size, very, very flexible changes. So again, I've just highlighted here this difference in where the biggest body sizes are in both the single species that change, but between these three groups and then the bracket pod, they show very different records. And the only explanation we have for this is that the, their physiological response to whatever is going on must be different. And our best guess at the moment, uh, although this requires further testing, is that these 
early, earliest animals are responding to these pulses of oxygenation. And these pulses of oxygenation also may be bringing nutrients into these shallow marine lower Cambrian seas. And that also produces a increase of body size. So for example, here, I've just highlighted um, where these changes are. So in blue are these, uh, these three major groups, and I've shown an arrow below. This is where body size increases. And in, in gray, I've shown where the body size decreases. So, so gr in other words, gray, the gray shading is body si where the body size gets smaller, and the blue shading is where body size gets bigger. And if we look at the record on the Siberian platform, we look at the, the geochemistry. So there's some incredible, very, very dynamic changes in the carbon cycle in this platform exactly through this bit of time. You can see here that the carbon cycle is going up and down and up and down. And what this means geochemically has been modeled, and it's been modeled underneath in this brown line here, it's been modeled to show these pulses of oxygenation. So in other words, uh, where you, um, so I've put this far in a slightly different, wrong place in the sense, but you can see here with a red arrow, that's a pulse of oxygenation. And a, a, a dark arrow there, the black arrow, is a decrease in oxygenation. In other words, what we seem to be seeing is that the ebbing and flowing of this body size, small body size, large, small body size, is tracking these oxygenation pulses, oxygenation and productivity pulses, which is fascinating. It means that the actual dynamics of the Cambrian explosion may in part be driven by these pulses of oxygenation. However, what's so intriguing is not all these animals are responding the same, as I said, the brachiopods have a very, very different pattern. And also, they are responding very, very differently to this mass extinction event. As I said, this mass extinction event is the very first mass extinction event in the Phanerozoic, and it knocks out many of the really iconic groups of the Cambrian, never to be seen again, like the, these sponges and the hyalis, for example. But the brachiopods, of course, we know march on and get more and more diverse through the Paleozoic, uh, at least. So in other words, they have a very different response to this mass extinction, which may be telling us something about their behavior, their different behavior with changing oxygen conditions. And that's significant because not only is that determining the actual uh, dynamics of the Cambrian explosion itself, but it also determines the nature of its demise the end of the Cambrian explosion shown here by this extinct event. It may be determining what gets through and what doesn't. In other words, what gets to survive into the rest of the Phanerozoic and in the case of the brachiopods become very, very important uh, animals in the biota. So I think that we've gone, gone some way to starting to prove the second hypothesis that it's this really dynamic oxygenation that may be controlling the tempo of the Ediacaran Cambrian explosion. But it's far more complicated than that because different animals respond differently. And this may be down to physiological differences with how they respond to this dynamic oxygenation and productivity. So just to end, uh, I hope that I've convinced you with these just two little short tales from the Cambrian that oxygen might well be a very important control in shaping the Cambrian explosion. But it is very, very complex. Ox the oxygen story is not simple. It's a very dynamic story. We're only just starting to understand uh, the real nature of the record. And it certainly had a very, very complex interaction with the record that we see of the Cambrian explosion. So thank you very much. Thank you so much to Rachel for that wonderful talk that just sat so nicely in our series, wrapping it all up. And as and has been debated this week on, we put out a Twitter poll earlier in the week. Was the Cambrian explosion caused by ocean chemistry or rise in oxygen? And 61% of our respondents agree with Rachel. <laughs> it's oxygen. So you, that, the, the Twitter sphere is with you, Rachel. And just before 
um, we do some questions. And if you have any questions, do keep them coming in on the chat. Just a little talk about what's coming next, because while First Animals is over, unfortunately, um, this this series of lectures will go on. So in two weeks time, we will have the first of our what we're calling our visions of nature talks. So our first will be our very good friend, Dr. Ricardo Perez de la Fuente, talking about fossil insect wonders. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it will be a most interesting talk. Some of you might have seen uh, Ricardo's viral video on YouTube earlier in the year, how to tell the difference between real and fake amber. Well, if that's anything to go by in two weeks time, this will be quite the talk to see. And then two weeks after that, uh, we have Dr. Lauren Sumner Rooney, who will be giving us the wonderfully titled talk, All the Better to See You With, How Do Many-Eyed Animals See the World? So we're going to be looking into the many types of animals that have lots and lots of eyes. So spiders come to mind, but there are also many other things. So do book on that. And I will put the um, booking details up for Ricardo's talk in a moment. But for the time being, we should go to our questions. So I'm going to go to, uh, let's go to Phil, who I think is in Bristol or Yorkshire. I can't remember now. He asks uh, about iron speciation. So that measurement you were doing on the different types of iron. And he says, when using iron speciation as a proxy for seawater oxygenation, how do you account for later diagenetic and metamorphic effects on mineral redox states? So for everyone at home, just to remind you, uh, diagenesis and metamorphism, this is what happens when, when rocks get squashed and heated, and it can sometimes change the chemistry. And I think what Phil is saying is, Rachel, can we believe your measurements or have they been cooked? <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a specialist on this, but I think uh, you can believe them. Um, the, so I, just to give you a bit of background, iron speciation was a technique that was developed by Simon Poulton at Leeds and Don Canfield in, uh, near Copenhagen. And it was calibrated on modern sediments. So in other words, they went all over the world to places where you have oxygenated and anoxic waters. So anoxic waters like the, um, the Black Sea. And uh, they found that this relationship was uh, very, very robust. Now, in general, when you're dealing with plastic sediments, in other words, sediments that are uh, reworked from pre-existing sediments, shales, silts, um, they found that you really cannot um, use this technique on coarse-grained sediments like sandstones. So. Uh, sadly, all of the rocks that, that, that have borne some of these amazing soft-bodied Idracara fossils that we've heard about from, uh, um, that, 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 for example, Jack talked about from a uh, mistaken point in, in um, uh, you, you can only really apply this, this technique to fine grain rocks. Now, in, in mistaken point and, and the Avalon Peninsula, you do have very fine grain layers that you can, you can um, tackle. But uh, the other classic sites like the Edakara Hills of Australia, these coarse grain quartzites, you really can't use iron speciation. You can't use it where there is a um, very, um, and that's because of the, the, the dynamics of what's called the iron trap in very, very shallow waters. You also can't use it on any carbonates that have been undergone dolomitization, uh, late stage burial dolomitization. Because what we've discovered is in carbonates, I mean, the, the critical measurement here is the total amount of highly reactive iron. And very few diagenetic processes, they, they, they may move, they may move uh, around the highly reactive diagenetic iron within that pool, but they don't uh, um, increase or decrease the size of that pool. Um, the, the, the settings that do is, as I say, deep late stage burial dolomitization will mess that up. Um, shallow marine, um, coarse grained material will mess that up. And so will very, very rapidly deposited sediments. So those are the, those are the main caveats. But I would say I'm, I'm no specialist and you do have to always apply iron speciation with great care. 
It will also change if you're looking at iron stones or um, local burrowing activity, you will get, a, you, you can get a false signature. So you do have to be very, very careful with how, how it is applied. But if it is applied properly, with a good knowledge of the, the, the chemical constraints, it is a very powerful technique. There you go, Phil. Be careful with your iron speciation, but it's very, very useful. And while we're on iron and oxygen, we have a question from Alex Hans, who asks, is it true that the formation of banded iron formations held up the increase in oxygen levels of the oceans and therefore held up the explosion of life, which eventually happened in the Cambrian? Just a reminder, those banded iron formations are much older, generally much older than the rocks uh, Rachel's been talking about today. And these are very iron rich of rocks, rusty red rocks. I'm not sure the two things are connected. And there's a, there's a huge amount of work going on of, on the banded iron formations and what they really mean. But the further back we go in time, we realize that that image I showed you of a absolutely static anoxic sea in the uh, um, deep free cabin, if you like, it's almost certainly not the case. It turns out that there are probably other oxygenation pulses coming up through geological, uh, going, you know, piercing this bit of geological time. We know, of course, there was a rise of oxygenation in what's called the Great Oxidation Event, um, approximately 2.1, 2.2 billion years ago. Uh, and there were almost certainly other pulses as well. Um, so the, and I believe the banded, Jack, you're having a glass of wine. Um, the banded iron, <laughs> the, the banded iron formations, are um, they, they slightly they peter out, but then they slightly come back again after about 1.8 um, billion years. So they, they disappear, um, I, I believe, approximately 1.8 billion years ago, but then they sort of come back. They definitely do tell us something about oxygenation, but I think the that story is still an area of, of active research to work out what it really means. But of course, we, we should, it's a, what, one way to think about this is that all these events in geological time are potentially slightly predicated on uh, events prior to that. So if you think about these events as linear, which I suppose is we like as human beings, um, you know, the, the, you're just seeing the Earth shift from a whole series of different states. And sometimes these states are transient and sometimes they shift and they remain more permanent. But, you know, even in the Phanerozoic, of course, we'd see these incredible changes of oxygenation, the, the very high levels, for example, that we saw in the Carboniferous. So um, I, I don't think there's any direct relationship between the banded iron formations and the, and the Cambrian explosion. Well, thank you very much. And I, it, this is specially selected, Rachel. It pairs very well with discussions of ferruginous... Uh, <laughs> Certainly um, fermented, yeah. Uh, South African pinotage. Um, but we go to a question from Matthew, moving on to discussions of the, some of the wonderful fossils and your brilliant data sets. Um, Matthew asks, are the brachiopods getting bigger after the extinction event because they are uh, they are infilling an empty evolutionary niche left by the competitors who have got smaller. Well, it's possible. Um, it, the, these, these hypotheses, of course, are quite difficult to prove. You've got to show that they really are living in the same niche, which means living in the same place and eating the same things. Um, the, I, I wouldn't like to say yes at all. The, the demands, the physiological, brachiopods are actually rather interesting things. They, um, they have very different energetic energetics compared to mollusks. And my, my suspicion is it's actually about metabolic demand. But we have a huge problem. Uh, we can measure uh, metabolic demands in, in other words, which is one aspect of the physiology of modern brachiopods and modern mollusks. But can we really say that these, they were the same in the Cambrian? Is the present the key to the past? I, I think it's a very, it's very problematic. Uh, it's very tempting because we have no no other way of guessing uh, what these things needed. Um, obviously, if if our geochemistry is sufficiently precise, so for example, let's say we could um, we could 
potentially find fossils that lived in these very low oxygen conditions. And then we could say something clearly about their demand. But if they're all living in these, uh, if they're living in conditions that are indicated by oxygenation, th th I mean, we're really at a limit of our geochemical techniques. These, these ge ge geochemical techniques are slightly crude. So iron speciation is wonderful, but it doesn't give you any idea of how much oxygen. It just tells you there is free oxygen. It doesn't tell you if there's a huge amount of it or really not very much. It just tells you there is free oxygen. Uh, and at the moment, we have very few other really, uh, m really good uh, methods that allow us to quantify the amount of oxygen um, in the in the record. That's what we would need in an ideal world. So it, it, your idea is is possible, and I know it's this is something that is very um, a very persuasive story. For example, the rise of the mammals after the um, after the KT extinction of the you know the um, dinosaurs and the Cretaceous but for I, I would I would like to say we have not yet tested that hypothesis for the brachiopods after this first Cambrian mass extinction. Just before we go to the next question um, a, a reminder that if you have enjoyed um, tonight's talk and the series as a whole uh, and you are able to, please do consider making your donation to the museum. The museum is a charity and as well as putting on public engagement events like this one, we're of course responsible for our wonderful building, which you are more than welcome to visit now. And of course, over 7 million objects in our collections and details of how to donate are currently in the chat. Um, we go over to a question from Huna Deek, who asks, did other chemicals outside of oxygen in the water play a role in the growth of the sizes of animals such as salinity changes or more calcite being available for skeleton building? Hi Huna, um, it's a good question. I, I could have given you an equally long talk on the role of seawater chem chem chemistry. So I think there are some very interesting changes going on with, for example, uh, how probably um, uh, magnesium calcium ratios in the sea and how they change and how they so for, for example when you when you look at these rocks on the Siberian platform uh, and you go to the uh, late Edia current and you look at the very first uh, cements that are precipitated in the pore spaces in grains and this tells you if these cements if you can show that these cements were precipitated from seawater, and that's always slightly tricky, but if you can show they were precipitated from seawater, what you see is some remarkable changes. You see that in, in the late, the last um, 20 million years or so of the Ediacaran, those cements, at least where I've looked at in, in Siberia, they're made of dolomite, which is calcium magnesium carbonate. Then you go to the early, earliest Cambrian, the first few million years of the earliest Cambrian, and they're aragonite which is calcium carbonate, and aragonite has a, it's a particular crystal form. But then you get to the middle Cambrian, and all those cements switch to, to calcite, which is still calcium carbonate, but it actually has slightly less magnesium in its crystal lattice. And what we think is going on is that the magnesium-calcium ratios are slowly declining through this time. And we know from just normal aqueous geochemistry that if you if you have uh, waters that are full of magnesium and are actually um, other conditions, uh, if the other conditions are right, you can form dolomite, particularly if there's a, a temperature elevation. But as you, um, dolomite's a bit of a tricky mineral to form, but as you slowly decrease calcium magnesium ratios, you go down to cal uh, you go to aragonite and then calcite. Now, what's so interesting is that dolomite, nothing ever builds its skeleton out of dolomite. Because um, uh, we, because it's actually a very, very complex crystal to, to form. It needs, it's a, a very um, complex crystal lattice. But plenty of things form a skeleton out of aragonite and calcite. And uh, the, um, the, uh, what's so interesting is when we when the seas switch from dolomite to calcite, that's when we see the very oldest animals forming a skeleton, sorry, forming a skeleton of aragonite and high magnesium calcite. 
and not until we go to when the skeletons become calcite, low magnesium calcite, do we see all the animals that produce a skeleton of calcite, and that includes the trilobites. So it looks like, and the trilobites, of course, their eyes are made of calcite. So it looks like there may be a connection between changing seawater chemistry once the chemistry changes to allow the precipitation of what's called low magnesium calcite, that seems to allow these uh, trilobites to produce a skeleton of low magnesium calcite, but not before. You can't produce a trilobite eye out of aragonite. Aragonite does not have the same optical properties. So there's a very, very interesting connection here between what animals are building their skeletons out of the minerals and also um, uh, you know, changing seawater chemistry. So of course, the big question is, what is driving seawater chemistry at this time? Which leads us nicely into the net. We'll take a final few questions and I'm gonna combine uh, a question from uh, Matthew with a question from Sharon. And we'll ask, you talked about changes in oxygen, but what is driving those changes in oxygen? And Matthew and Sharon have said, you know, is it about overpopulation consuming all that oxygen or is it about climate change or glaciation or continental movements and tectonics? So what do you think is driving these changes in oxygen that you've measured? Well, this is the, this is the million dollar question. Um, we, we probably don't have one driver for all the oxic events and there are many many of these and they, they possibly have some similarities but they may well have different drivers now if we think about just the the ones i i talked about on the um the siberian platform these are very, these are are um are very short-lived these are only two and a half or so two two to three million years long each of these these pulses so these carbon cycles I showed you, each one is only about two and a half million years long. Now, we don't have, uh, we don't think it's, it's related to glaciations. Um, it may be related to changes in sea level, but we don't know that for sure. Uh, and it's far from proven. It may be related to um, uh, productivity. Uh, in other words, it, sometimes it's very difficult to know chicken and egg in these situations. In other words, what's what's driving what? Is the productivity driving the carbon record or is the carbon right record a manifestation of the productivity changes? So uh, the, the short answer is we really don't know. There are There are ideas out there, but they all remain to be tested. So it is it is a critical question. What is driving these? And that we may, I think we're probably going to have to scrutinize each one of these events separately, or at least in sort of clusters, to really understand the drivers. And the drivers might well change through time, but you've got to evoke something that is changing over what is two and a half million years. Of course, it's an immense amount of time, but when we're talking about the Ediacaran to Cambrian, these are really quite short-lived changes. So we, we, can't, we can't place this at the, as, at the feet of plate tectonics. That's... That's a, those are very slow changes. It's got to be something that operates on a, a faster time scale. There's a challenge to the young people in the audience. Come and join the geosciences and work out uh, what the driver is behind <laughs> the oxygen <laughs> trigger of the Cambrian explosion. Um, and we'll get to a, a final question. And um, nobody's asked our usual question this week, so I'm going to ask it. And you talked, you covered a great deal of geological time, uh, Rachel, and talked about all sorts of weird beasties and critters that are found in sites around the world. Um, uh, are they animals? Are they not? Who knows? That's why they're so interesting. Um, but the question I'm going to ask you is, what's your favourite fossil? <laughs> um, I should have prepared for this question. I... I... <sighs> I don't really have a favorite fossil, I, what, but I'm, I'm just going to ask a very different, I'm not going to give you a very different answer. Maybe you, maybe you uh, sense that there is half of the 
Cambrian and Ediacaran subcommission colleagues are in the audience. <laughs> you have to be very diplomatic. Yes, I, I, what, what I would dearly like to know is I would love to be in a time capsule and to be snorkeling over, I'm afraid, the Ediacaran seafloor, not the Cambrian seafloor. The Cambrian forms, I think we have a pretty good idea what most of these Cambrian forms are. We, 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 they, most of them fit into modern phyla, not all, but most of them are, are, um, are recognizable. But these Ediacaran forms are truly, truly baffling. And we're making huge progress now and starting to understand what they might be. But I would just love to be able to swim over a meadow of Cloudina tubes and Namaclaphus tubes. These are these Ediacaran Cambrian, uh, sorry, Ediacaran um, skeletal animals. And just pick one up and see what its soft tissue was and say, ah, oh, it was a whatever, blah, 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 after all. That's what I would like. So a, a time machine to go and work out the, uh, as we said, the taxonomic affinity of some of these beasts. Well, we can we can dream. Maybe there's a, a young engineer watching and sort, <laughs> sort, sort that out for us in a few years time. At that point, Rachel, thank you so much once again for a very brilliant and well-timed talk at the end of our series, perfectly positioned with the question and answers you've been providing. So thank you so much. Um, lots of wonderful positive uh, comments in the chat. Thank you uh, once again. And just a reminder to everyone at home that we, although First Animals is over, um, we very much hope we will be seeing you in two weeks' time um, when Ricardo will be giving his talk, Fossil Insect Wonders. So we'll be exploring a different bit of the fossil record in some much younger deposits. Um, and Ricardo, knowing Ricardo, he will bring that alive and it will be a very, very exciting talk. So we very much hope to see you again in two weeks time. Fingers crossed we'll be coming live from the court of the museum as well so that's another exciting development on the way but at that point we say thank you once more to rachel uh, hopefully see you in person soon um and thank you once again for joining us from all around the world and we hopefully see you again in two weeks time Bye -bye. wonderful bye thank you jack